There we go. All right, everyone can see that again, right? Yes, okay. So underwater archeology, span one of my absolute favorite topics to talk about. Um, this is what I studied when I was becoming or becoming an archeologist and I'm still studying it today as I continue my education as an archeologist. And it's my favorite topic for a ton of reasons, many of which you're going to learn about right now. So to learn about underwater archeology, span we're going to answer three questions. What archeology span is, how we do archeology, span why we do archeology, span and then at the very end, I'm going to talk about two shipwrecks, which are where I am right now, which is Pensacola, Florida. We have two really cool shipwrecks to learn about at the end of this talk. So moving forward, to understand what underwater archaeology is, we first have to learn about what just plain old archaeology is. And we define archaeology as the study of past people and their cultures based on the things that they've left behind. A lot of people think that archaeologists study things like dinosaurs or rocks, or we just look for treasure and gold and silver and jewels. And while all of those things are cool in their own right, it's not what archaeology is. Those are often their own sciences. And then treasure hunting is just treasure hunting. That's a different thing altogether. But archaeology is a study of past people and their culture based on the things they've left behind. And here in the United States, if you're going to go to school to become an archaeologist, you're actually going to get your degree in something called anthropology. And archaeology is just one of four parts of anthropology, the other being cultural anthropology, so the study of cultures, biological anthropology, which is the study of the human body and how the human body works. And then we've got linguistic anthropology, which is the study of human languages, past and present. So languages that speak, people speak today and languages that people no longer speak. So we're gonna focus on archeology, span of course, because that's the coolest one in that list. And of those, underwater archeology. span um, Now, is underwater archeology span different than just plain old archeology? span It's not. We're doing the same thing that archeologists on land do. We're just doing it underwater. And so here's some good photos of some of my friends doing underwater archeology. span um, the person on the left, you can see he has a shipwreck underneath him. You can see some of the wood from that shipwreck. Um, we're going to talk more about that stuff in a second. He is working in the Florida Keys, which is a beautiful place to work. The people on the right are actually students here at the University of West Florida working on a shipwreck. And you can see some of the wood right underneath the girl with the clipboard. Um, they're working on a shipwreck here in Pensacola Bay in only about 12 feet of water. So pretty cool stuff. We're gonna talk more about both of those wrecks. So if archeology span is the study of past people and cultures based on the things they've left behind, we don't usually like to say things when we write scientific reports. So we call these things that people have left behind artifacts. And simply put, an artifact is anything that has been made or used by humans. What are some examples? Here's a cool example. This is a lantern from a shipwreck that was found in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a shipwreck that's actually about 2,000 feet deep. Now, can archaeologists visit the site in person? No way, it's way too deep. But we are able to send robots, or ROVs, remote operated vehicles, down to do the excavation or removal of artifacts for us. And that takes a lot of work and a lot of money to do, but people do it. There's a lot of good archaeology very deep in our ocean. Here's a really interesting artifact. This is a boot. Um, this is a boot from a shipwreck that dates to the Civil War period, and this was found in St. John's River, Florida, on a shipwreck called the Maple Leaf. So this is on the east coast of Florida near the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and that ship actually hit a mine, um, so a, kind of like a torpedo. Um, it wrecked in the St. John's River, but it had lots of supplies on it that have provided a lot of information to archaeologists about the Civil War period. And this last artifact on here, it's kind of hard to tell because it's caked in mud, but this is actually the very end of a cannon. And so when metal objects end up in the water for a long time, they rust. And I'm sure you've seen rust at home on metal things. We live in a really salty, humid place. And metal, when it's left outside for a long time, it can rust. Um, and that's what happened to this cannon. Um, it's all rusty. But the cool thing about archaeology is there's a science behind it. And to conserve artifacts as they come out of the water, 
um, we can do a number of different treatments so that we can actually try to make the artifacts look like they would have been when they were out of the water. Um, and so we can do the best we can to get artifacts looking <clears throat> the way they should so that they can go on display in museums for everybody to see. Oops. All right. So that's what underwater archaeology is. There are a lot of things that underwater archaeology is not, too. So uh, when people think of shipwrecks and underwater archaeology, a lot of what comes to mind are things like Spanish gold and pirate treasure. I'm not saying that those things don't exist. Sorry, I'm letting someone into our room here. Um, I'm not saying that those things don't exist. There are examples of shipwrecks that have had gold on them, right? Spanish gold, particularly, that came from places like Central and South America and it was heading back to Spain but got wrecked in the storm. We do find shipwrecks like that. Are there pirate shipwrecks? They are out there. Two or three in the United States have been identified. One's Queen Anne's Revenge, which is off North Carolina. We think that was Blackbeard's ship. And then there's another shipwreck called the Witta in Massachusetts, which we also believe was a pirate shipwreck. But is that the majority of what people, archeologists, when I say people, is that the majority of what we find? Uh, no, it's not. It's not. People think about how many boats are on the water at a given time. How many of those ships throughout history have been laden with Spanish gold or filled with pirate treasure? Not a lot of them. A very small fraction. So all those things do exist. That's not all we do. Arche underwater archaeology is actually a lot cooler than that, I think. Here's what shipwrecks actually look like, right? So I don't know if you all can see my mouse pointing up here. If you can't, that's okay. The top left shipwreck, the one that's with lots of trees in the background, that's actually a steamship that it's wrecked just over the border in Alabama. That's what a shipwreck actually looks like, right? The next one over, this is a ballast pile from a shipwreck in the Florida Keys. What is a ballast pile? And wooden ships, if you think about the bottom of a ship, right? If you just put a ship on the water, it's gonna to toss around a lot. Wood essentially acts like a cork when it's on top of water. In order to weigh a ship down so that it can cut through the water, you need to put something heavy in it. And sometimes that is cargo, so people move things around the world. But if you don't have a lot of cargo, you can put stones or metal or cement in the bottom of your ship to help it go through the water. And that's what you're seeing in this picture. It's just a big pile of stones that used to be in the bottom of a ship. The wood from that ship has rotted away over time, because it wasn't buried or protected, but the stones are still there, as you can see. If we move down to the bottom, you see some wood on a beach. That's actually, again, the very bottom part, the bottom hull of a ship. And so if you think about it like this, the, the straight line that's going straight out out from your computer screen, that's kind of like the backbone of a ship. The things coming out to the side like this, those are the ribs of the ship. So it's easy to help think about it like a human body. Um, and that ship, of course, was probably wrecked during a storm or hurricane and blown onto the beach and just kind of left there over time. And then the very last picture in the bottom right are two shipwrecks side by side in a river here in Pensacola. Actually, this is the Escambia River. And you can see that there are two shipwrecks. Um, one has got more of a square shape and one has got more of a kind of like a torpedo shape. And that's a good example of the different functions of ships, right? The big square ship, that's not gonna go very fast in the water, but would have been really good for hauling a lot of cargo. The torpedo shaped ship <clears throat> wasn't going to haul as much cargo, but uh, it got through the water a lot faster. And so where these shipwrecks are located is just south of the I-10 bridge here in Pensacola. And it's uh, part of a ship's graveyard. There's actually 15 to 17 shipwrecks in this area that were just kind of hauled up there and left, and they're, they're still there today. And they were left there about 100 years ago, if you're wondering how old they are. <laughs> so oh, I've zoomed in on all of these. Sorry, guys. There's our photos of our shipwrecks. Should have kept clicking. All right. So I talk a lot about shipwrecks because that's a lot of what underwater archaeology studies, but the greater underwater archaeology discipline or science studies what we call submerged cultural resources. That's a long name, a fancy word for things that are underwater that humans made. Um, and it's not all shipwrecks. There's actually a lot of other really cool examples. 
So we heard about the shipwrecks. We have wooden shipwrecks. This is a picture of a metal hauled shipwreck, so much later than those wooden ones that we saw before. Um, but there are things like Native American shell mounds, right? This is a river in Florida where there's a Native American shell mound that has been eroding away into the water, right? Underwater archaeologists could study this and have studied this. Here's a city. This is actually, this is not Florida. This is a city on the coast of Israel. It's called Caesarea Maritima. Um, and it dates, the city um, was actually under King Herod's rule. So if you're familiar with Bible stories, it's the same King Herod. He ruled over the city. And it was actually one of the leading port cities on the coast of Israel at the time. And the cool thing about it was that it was, Israel doesn't have a lot of natural ports. So the folks who were living there actually used an early form of water hardening concrete to create their own port. And so you can see the, the land, you can see the water, and if you look in the water, you see the darker colored areas, right? That's where the old port was, and you can see how it kind of hooks out. So ships would travel into the port, drop off their goods, and then leave. So what happened here? Well, an earthquake happened. So when the earthquake came along eventually on the city, it did what we call liquefaction to the sand. The earth shook the sand so much that it essentially turns to liquid and all of the buildings that were sitting on top of that sand just slump into the water. And that's what you're seeing there. And everything is still mostly intact. Now today, like non today, this is a major tourist attraction, right? Divers can go there. They can check in at a medieval castle, which is located on the outer edge of this port. It's now a dive shop. They can get a little card and they can dive and go underwater and visit all of these historic sites. So really cool thing. So underwater archeologists can study cities. Not a very good picture, but another example of a city that has sunk into the sea and had archeological work done on it. This is from a place called Port Royal. In Jamaica and if you've seen the Pirates of the Caribbean movies you may be familiar with that name Port Royal it was a real place and it was at one point a pirate haven and this is in the um, obviously in the Caribbean near in Jamaica to, well now it's underwater but it would have been in Jamaica um, so Port Royal same thing happened earthquake the sand liquefied half of the entire city just sunk into the sea. And if you look really closely, you can see that the building foundations, those little brick pieces under the diver, are still like they would have been when they were part of a building, right? And so archeologists have actually been able to take a map of the Port Royal City, like it was um, when it was documented back in the 1700s, 1600s, and lay it out over what they found and be able to determine which building was what, whether it was a home or a tavern or what have you, it could be anything, but we're able to use historical documents to actually identify these places because they are so well preserved. Here's an interesting photo. So this is a shipwreck. It doesn't look like much right now, but it's actually a steamship called the Barbara Hunt. And this is on the Apalachicola River which is just to the east of us here in Pensacola and Panama City. And this shipwreck, it was a steamship that used to carry cargo and goods up and down the Apalachicola River. And it wrecked eventually, just fell into disuse and got pulled off to the side of the river so it could end its years. Um, today, it serves as a great fishing spot out there. Other kinds of things underwater archaeologists study, lighthouses, right? Lighthouses are how historically people have been able to guide ships through treacherous waters. Florida has a lot of treacherous waters. Our waters are very shallow. There's a lot of sand. But on the East Coast, especially down near the Keys in Miami, there's a lot of coral reefs. And coral reefs can be deadly for a wooden ship. So lighthouses were constructed all up and down the Florida Keys and all up and down Florida to help guide ships out of trouble. Here's a different looking one. This is actually an ancient fish weir, um, essentially a fish trap. So Native American peoples would often build these um, and it's constructed so that a fish can swim in but it can't get back out, kind of like a Chinese finger trap for fish, right? So it's like a, a refrigerator before we had refrigerators, a place to store fresh food before we could do that with a refrigerator. So 
we do find remnants of these still. Obviously, they don't look like this. This is a reconstruction that was done. Um, but we do still find the remains of some posts that were used as part of fish wheels. So we can study ancient people's eating habits. And finally, here's my, here's my modern archaeology site. A long time ago, in the, in the 1980s, so about 30 years ago or so, 30, 40 years, uh, people thought it was a good idea to throw tires in the ocean to become artificial reefs for fish. Now today we know that's not a great idea because tires have lots of chemicals in them that then leach into the oceans and cause pollution. Um, so this was kind of you know, while there are some programs to remove tires, um, I think an archaeologist in the future is going to be wondering why there are so many darn tires under the water, and they're going to try and figure out what it means about our culture today. Um, and they'll have a hard time knowing, probably. <laughs> All right, so we've answered what archaeology is. Let's answer how we do archaeology, underwater archaeology. And the answer for that really is, we do it just like we do archaeology on land. It's just that the tools are a little different. So archaeologists essentially dig or excavate to find artifacts that people in the past have left behind. Now, it's hard to use a trowel and a shovel underwater, um, so we do things a little differently. <clears throat> archaeologists have to be very precise when they dig. We don't just go dig up entire places. That takes a lot of time, a lot of money. We don't have all of that, right? So we have to be very careful about where we're digging and do it very precisely so we don't lose information. So we often work in square units, right? So what you're seeing in this photo here is a square unit that has been laid out using PVC pipes underwater. On land, we use string, but it's a lot harder to use the string underwater. Like on land, we record everything that we find and take photographs, but our tools are a little bit different for doing it. On the picture on the left, you can see two divers using a slate, basically a, car a clipboard and paper, and taking some notes on the shipwreck site that they're diving. Interesting thing is, the paper that they're using is called mylar. It's actually a really thin plastic. It's really cool, and you can write on it underwater, and it doesn't go away, right? You take a regular piece of paper underwater, that's not gonna last very long. But these thin plastic sheets of paper work really well. And the tool that she's using to write is just a plain old mechanical pencil. That's what we use underwater. Pens don't work, but pencils do. And then the picture on the right, this one actually, uh, full disclosure, this is a picture of me working on an archaeological site underwater. It's the best one I could find. But what I'm doing here is taking a measurement for how deep I'm excavating. I mentioned that we dig really carefully and slowly. And we have to so that we can record everything that we find. If we don't do that, we lose that information. We can't put everything back together like we found it. So we go very slowly. So here, I'm using a laser in one hand to take a measurement with the ruler in the other hand. Oh, ugh, got me again on the photos. So there's some folks writing, taking measurements. And then the part that most people really wanna hear about is the actual digging or the excavating. And for this one, I actually have a photo. So if you have volume, which I'm sure you can all hear me, so you have volumes on, but I wanna make sure you get this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and play it. These are archeologists from the University of West Florida using a tool called an induction dredge to excavate the sand off of a shipwreck here in Pensacola. It's essentially a big underwater vacuum. And they're working very carefully. You see, they're not just scooping out big chunks of mud and sand. They're working very carefully to get the sand off of that wreck. So that way they can document anything they find. I'll play it one more time. If you want to see it again. So we use a really gentle method of excavation we call hand fanning. And that's just moving your hand like this. Cool stuff. So, where does all of that material go that sucked up into that vacuum? Well, oh no, my next slide. It goes, often it goes up to a research platform or the boat that you're working from. So you can see the hose coming out of the water here, right? 
And all of that water is getting dumped onto what is a large screen. So if you have a screen on a door or windows at home, it has lots of holes in it. And that way the water can fall back through um, and the sand, because the sand's often really tiny, but any artifacts are left behind. So that way we can make sure that we don't miss a thing. All right, so now we know how we do underwater, underwater archaeology. Question is, why do, we, why do we do it? So why should we care about underwater archaeology? Shipwrecks are cool, right? I think a lot of people agree shipwrecks are just really cool, but they can also help us learn a lot about the past. So they have other significance besides just being cool places to visit. So I like to have a friend for this one. So I talked a lot about how shipwrecks aren't pirates. And of course, then I go and use this picture. But Captain Jack Sparrow does have a really good quote in here in the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. And what he says is, that's what a ship is. It's not just a keel and a hull and a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. Uh, but what a ship is, and here he's talking about his ship, the Black Pearl. Um, but what a ship is, is freedom, right? So it's about the meaning behind the ship. And to me, that's what underwater archaeology is trying to get at. Yes, the artifacts are cool. Yes, the shipwreck is a cool place to dive. But what does it mean about human history? What does it tell us about the human story? Well, it can tell us a lot of things, as it turns out. So shipwrecks are clues to the human past. They tell us about how people lived their life, right? They can tell us about the things that people traded across oceans. Why did one place need one thing and the other place need another thing? Shipwrecks can tell us how people navigated across the globe before they had GPS, before we had satellites. How did people move around? Shipwrecks can tell us about colonization and movement, why people live in the places that they do. Shipwrecks can tell us about warfare, right? How weapons changed over time, why people were fighting with one another. Shipwrecks can also tell us about disease, um, things like the Black Plague, that was affecting Europe significantly in the 1500s, 1600s. We can often see the movement of the plague based on where ships were docking in ports in Europe. And why is that? Because the plague was carried by rats. And where do rats love to live? On ships, right? Pretty cool stuff. Ships can tell us about language and culture. Why is it that in the United States, in Central America and South America, the languages we primarily speak are English, Spanish, and Portuguese? Why is that? Well, the answer is because those came over on ships, right? Before the arrival of Europeans, the languages were very different in these places. And the languages we speak today largely came over on those ships. And so all of this is just to say, right, shipwrecks tell us about people. They tell us about the story of humans. And that's why they're amazing. I don't know why all these little dots are coming up on my screen. I don't know if anyone else can see those too, but anyways, so why are shipwrecks important to archeology? span Well, they tell us about people's lifeways, um, but the cool thing about shipwrecks is that they're different than sites on land. Um, people don't live underwater, right? We can't live underwater because we don't breathe underwater. When archeologists start doing underwater archeology, span we use scuba gear to breathe. Um, since people don't live underwater, there aren't a whole lot of archaeological sites underwater. Um, and so that creates less confusion for archaeologists. Oops. Here. Is anyone else seeing those lines that are coming up on my screen? Huh. Yes. Yeah. Someone's I don't know where those are coming from. All right, ignore those. They're not part of the presentation. But there are less archaeological sites around, so it's less confusing. On land, people tend to live in the same places over time, right? People like to live in places where there are fresh water, there's high ground, lots of food. So in places, especially like Pensacola, when we're doing archaeology, we're digging through centuries of human habitation or living. It's hard to tease those things out sometimes. What belongs to one archaeological site? What belongs to another? Underwater, that's not as much of a problem. Another cool thing about underwater archaeology is that things preserve really, really well, right? So looking at the artifacts in these pictures, we see things like peach pits and olive pits and little tiny bones that are from rats. Um, 
Other things we can see, spoons, a belt buckle. These things have been buried, right, for almost 400 years. And I'll talk about this shipwreck in a moment. Um, but they look this good almost 450 years later. So that's pretty incredible. That doesn't happen on land very often, especially in Florida where our soil is acidic. Um, so underwater environment is totally different. Um, and here's an example I like to use, and you'll see this one again. This is uh, black rat bones from a shipwreck here in Pensacola. Again, 450 years old, just about. So little tiny bones have survived for that long on a shipwreck underwater. So shipwrecks are important to archaeologists, but that's not it, really. Shipwrecks are also important to biologists and biology. I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> Someone quit drawing on the screen. Somebody, I, I wondered if somebody else was doing that. <clears throat> I wonder if I can turn that off somehow. All right, I'm going to keep going. So why are shipwrecks important to biology and biologists? Well, first thing is they serve as artificial reefs. When anything goes in the ocean, especially here in Florida, because we don't have a lot of um, stone or coral reefs except down in South Florida, um, anything that goes underwater instantly becomes a home for something else, right? So you see here, there's a shipwreck and some of those ballast stones, and then you see all these cute little spade fish walking around or swimming around on top of that shipwreck. Shipwrecks also serve as shelter for juvenile fish, right? Baby fish love shipwrecks because they can hide from predators. Here's some more little fish hiding from predators underneath the bones of this shipwreck. And then of course, shipwrecks and their ballast stones often become substrate or basically the basis for invertebrates like corals. So in the Florida Keys where there's a lot of corals, you see shipwrecks becoming brand new artificial coral reefs. So pretty excellent. I don't know if I can stop people from drawing on my slides. Um, if we could stop doing that, that would be super helpful so everyone can see. We want to make sure everyone has a good experience here. Um, and then just kind of summing up here, there are obviously a lot of problems that affect shipwrecks and other underwater archaeological sites. Sometimes people like to remove artifacts they find um, either intentionally because they want to sell them and they think they're worth some money, or maybe they just want to bring a souvenir home. I always encourage people to leave things in place. If we remove things from archaeological sites, they're not going to be there for archaeologists to study. And more importantly, they're not going to be there for anyone else to see. So if someone else comes along that wants to see the site just like you saw it, they're not going to be able to. And if everybody takes something from sites they visit, then there's not going to be anything left. So I always try and remind people not to remove anything they see, even though they may look pretty cool. And of course, other things affecting shipwrecks include things we call inadvertent human impact, which is people who maybe accidentally drop their anchor through a shipwreck if they're trying to go fishing. It does happen. Um, erosion from storms, especially hurricanes here in Florida. And development sometimes too can affect shipwrecks, like the building of bridges or dredging for ports. All right, so now we know what underwater archeology span is, how underwater archeologists do archeology, span why we do archaeology, and now I just wanted to share some cool case studies with you. And so these are the tales of two shipwrecks here in Pensacola, Florida, which is where I am. So the first shipwrecks I'm going to talk about are called the Emanuel Point shipwrecks, um, and that's because we don't know the names of these exact ships, so we just gave them a nickname. Um, but these shipwrecks were sunk here in Pensacola in 1559. Um, they were part of the first permanent settlement attempt in what is now Florida by someone named Don Tristan de Luna. It was a, a fleet of 11 ships and 1,500 people that came here to Pensacola from Mexico to try and establish a brand new colony. About a month after they arrived, you probably guessed what happened, there was a big hurricane, right? And the hurricane wiped out seven of the ships. Several of them made it back okay. Um, and one of them was wrecked on land. So there are seven ships that we know are underwater based on historical records. So we actually do have letters and correspondence. Um, 
The first ship from this settlement attempt was discovered in 1992. Um, the second ship was discovered in 2006, and then I don't have it on here, but the third shipwreck was discovered in 2015. So I'm going to move forward here. Now, where are these shipwrecks located? Here's a map of Pensacola for those of you who are familiar with the area. You can see Florida at the top left, Pensacola is in the far west part of Florida, even more west than Panama City. And these shipwrecks are located just about here, right? They were anchored, they were supplying the settlement, a hurricane came through and wrecked them all onto the sandbar. They're only in about 13 feet of water. And these are the shipwrecks where students at the University of West Florida learn how to do underwater archeology. span So this is where we all kind of learn how to do what we do. So here's some photos. Here's another student who is measuring, taking a depth measurement on his excavation unit. So you can see it's a nice square unit like we talked about. Here is a picture. For those of you who are familiar with Pensacola, there's Three Mile Bridge. You can see that going out of the frame out to Gulf Breeze and Pensacola Beach. And there's a little white dot in the water there. That's actually the University of West Florida's research platform. And so we have that permanently installed out there during the summertime so that we can use that to dive off of. And those shipwrecks are actually essentially right underneath that dive platform. Um, the only thing about working in Pensacola Bay is that it looks like this most of the time. And actually, I would say this is what it looks like on a good day. It's really dark, it's really murky. You can't see a whole lot, um, but that doesn't stop the site from being really, really cool. So here's some artifacts, and we've seen some of these already. P olive pits. Um, here's a little carving of a ship that we found. We don't know what it means. It could be a toy. It could be a model used when the ship was constructed. It could just be someone who was carving some wood. Um, we don't know the story, but it's really cool, nevertheless. We have found pottery that people ate from or served food from. There are those rat bones again. This is where we found that black rat. And an interesting thing is that this rat um, is actually the first known black rat in the United States. Um, so Pensacola, claim to fame right there, first black rat. Here's a spoon um, found on the shipwreck. Back in these days, people often would carry one utensil with them, and it was usually a spoon. And this would be the only one that they used. It's not like we have today, all kinds of utensils that we wash and then someone else uses. Uh, everyone had their own spoon. In the US. And it's called off of the Here's ship. Here's some pottery here. Um, this pottery is from actually some Aztec warriors that were brought on the expedition from Mexico to serve as bodyguards. Um, and you could argue that they were brought, they were probably uh, enslaved and made to come here to Pensacola because why would you want to leave your home? Um, but we do have evidence, material evidence that they were here. We have found shoe soles. So this is a leather shoe sole from a Spaniard who came to Pensacola. And this is an interesting little artifact. This is a vial of mercury. And why were people bringing that? Sometimes it was used as a medicine, um, but the Spanish, I think, were maybe hoping to find gold here in Pensacola. And as we know, there's not a whole lot of gold here in Northwest Florida, but mercury would often be used to extract gold from other stones. So we found some of that as well, pretty cool. Okay, so that's it for the 1559 shipwrecks. I went over them really quickly, but I wanted to make sure I include it because it is really interesting. And if I'll include a link at the end of the program. If you want more information about those shipwrecks, there's a really great website that the University of West Florida has hosted about them. Actually, maybe I'll go ahead and type it right now while I'm thinking about it. It's uwf.edu slash Luna. Lots more pictures on there. All right, so the second shipwreck I'm gonna talk about and the last thing in my presentation is the shipwreck of the Catherine. This is a much later shipwreck. Our Emanuel Point wrecks were from 1559. This one is from 1870, so almost 300 years later. And this ship was launched in 1870. Her first name was Eliza, and then she was eventually renamed Carnarvonshire, which is a weird name, but it was someone's last name. <laughs> so that's why it was named that way. It was a wooden hulled ship, and it had three masts. And the picture you're seeing actually is a picture of Eliza when she was built. So that's her right there. 
Um, she was what we called a tramp sailor. So she would just go around the world collecting cargoes of whatever she could find and bringing them to another port to sell them for as much profit as possible. Piece of shit. Mm -hmm. In 1890, she was renamed Catherine. And in 1894, August 7th to be exact, she was coming into Pensacola Bay, right? And if you're familiar with Pensacola Bay, we have only one way in and out. Um, and unfortunately, as she was trying to come in, she was wrecked in a storm. That's the story of most of these shipwrecks is they were wrecked in a storm. Um, fortunately, the crew was rescued and most of the cargo that it had was salvaged. Um, and then in 1998, the site was rediscovered again and investigated by the University of West Florida. Um, so here's, here's our map again. So you can see Pensacola Bay. There's one way in and one way out down there by Santa Rosa Island in the bottom left. And that's where Catherine wrecked. She was on her way in to Pensacola Bay, got caught in a storm and wrecked in the shallow sand. Here's probably my favorite photo in this entire presentation. This is actually a photograph of Catherine in the background in the water as she was wrecked off Santa Rosa Island. And you see in the foreground that there are some big strong dudes putting this lifeboat in the water. They're going to rescue the crew. It's fake. This is the morning after the ship wrecked. The newspaper wanted a good photograph, so they staged it. The crew was actually saved by a life housekeeper. A lot of islands would have um, life houses or safety houses so that they could detect shipwrecks and potentially save people. A life housekeeper and his teenage daughter were actually the two people that rescued the crew from the Catherine. So this is all a farce, um, but a cool photo nonetheless, because that is Catherine there in the background. So you can see it's not very far offshore. The ship was rediscovered, not by archaeologists, but actually by some local divers. They were out swimming around. They had just gotten certified to dive, and they found this sticking out of the bottom of the water. Um, and I know it's kind of hard to see there, but it's actually, it's metal, and it's shiny, so that, of course, tracks anybody. They took a photo, and they actually did the right thing. They contacted the University of West Florida and said, we think we've found something. Um, why don't you guys come and check it out? And so UWF did come out. And we found lots of other artifacts, which gave us clues about what the site was. Here's a bronze porthole or window, essentially, for the ship. There is the artifact that was sticking out of the sand. It's actually called a binnacle, and this would have housed the ship's compass. So the compass would have sat in top in the kind of cup part, and then what you're seeing are the legs coming down, and they're actually pretty fancy. Those are um, dolphins, not dolphins like we think of them, but dolphin fish. Um, as decoration. And then archaeologists found this, which we almost never find. This is the nameplate for the ship. So this is how we know what ship it is. And you can see it says Carnarvonshire, launched from 1871 in Liverpool. So something archaeologists never find. We got an actual name for the shipwreck and where it came from. So that is all I have for underwater archaeology and shipwrecks. Feel free to type questions. I see some in the chat box. Feel free to go ahead and type questions if you have them now. And I'll just end by saying we want to this. always encourage people to help it. archaeologists you're protect the on your picture. You're drawing on them. Tell your friends and family about the importance of archaeology, That's why it. underwater archaeology is so cool. People just doing stuff. Um, and why we care about it, right? What it tells us about human history. And then if you're interested in learning even more, we are doing a lot of these Zoom into archeology span presentations over the next few months. We're doing them because we can't get out into our communities like we normally can. Um, so stay tuned on our Facebook page, FPAN Northwest, or you can go to our website, fpan.us. Um, so you can find out all about these presentations, we're going to do them throughout. We have throughout June and July, we have um, one next week, and we will have not yet released the schedule for July, but that will be coming out soon. So lots of good resources and good ways to stay in touch with us. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to stop my screen sharing. And let me take a look at the chat box here, see what we got. Let me get out of my presentation. Um, let's see, let's see. Um, 
a lot of people saying that they have found artifacts. That's fantastic. Yes, we find artifacts everywhere. People have been all over this planet. Um, so finding something like that's really unique. And what I like to do when I find artifacts is try and guess what the story of that artifact is. How did it end up where it ended up? And you may not be right. You might not be wrong, but coming up with the story um, is a part of what archaeologists try and do. Um, someone asked if this presentation will be recorded. It is being recorded. Yep. Um, someone asked if the public can dive on the shipwrecks. And I think that was when I was talking about the Luna shipwrecks. Um, and then the answer to that is technically, yes, the public can dive on those shipwrecks. The information about their location is not publicly available. Um, it's not in um, uh, a, a reef site or a, a dive site um, like we find on the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail or the museums in, in the sea program. Um, but yes, if it is not illegal or prohibited to dive on those sites. Um, the only sites that really have restrictions like that in the United States, uh, there's actually two that totally prohibit diving. One is the Pearl Harbor Memorial in Hawaii um, because that's a grave site, right? And then there's also a shipwreck in Biscayne National Park in the Florida Keys um, that is so well preserved and of archaeological value that the National Park Service has determined that nobody can dive on it. So there are really only two exceptions to that. Um, the only thing that people can't do is take things off of those wrecks. You're welcome to go visit them, to go see them. Um, I will say the ones in Pensacola Bay are not a great scuba dive. <laughs> uh, it's very dark and murky, but as long as you don't take anything, anyone can dive on those sites. And let's see, we had a comment about the tiny ship carving. Yeah, and I agree, it might have been kind of like a model or maybe um, since this wasn't necessarily a burial site, like we're talking about ancient Egyptian period, I don't know if it had the same purpose, but um, certainly it functioned as a toy or a model or something to help um, people on that ship. So I don't totally know the story behind that. We can, I think anything that any of us guess are probably just as right as anything else. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? No? We do, I see a question. Is that Molly? You're welcome to unmute your microphone if you want to. Um, if you can. Um, is there... <laughs> Take your time. I forgot how to phrase it. Just give me a circle. Yeah, sure. I'll see. <laughs> All right, so... Folks, if you have to go, you're welcome to go. While Molly's thinking about her question, I'll just show, I have some 3D printed artifacts. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but I'll just show you some cool 3D printed artifacts. So these are not real artifacts. We printed them um, on our 3D machine and then we painted them to look like artifacts. So let me see what we got here. And these are all from uh, Spanish shipwrecks here in Florida um, that were collected by archeologists. So this, it kind of looks like a little weight, right? Like a dumbbell you would see in a gym. It's actually what we call bar shot. And this is kind of cool. We, a lot of people are interested in weapons and weaponry on ships. You would actually load this into a cannon, right? You would load it into a cannon and then it would shoot out. And it's, it wasn't really intended to hurt a person. What it would do instead is spin like this. And it would, be intended to take out the sails on other ships. So essentially like, what you're doing is trying to make yeah. other ships so they can't go anywhere and you can they would, board them or take their ship. Yeah, Molly, go ahead. They would try to use those. They would try, to, so they might have had a chain on them mm -hmm. if they were trying to, sometimes, and they were trying to like either knock out this mast or um, the, at least make a big hole in the sails. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct, yes. Yay. Yeah, and here actually along in a similar vein then, here's another one. This is called canister shot. So something else that would go into a cannon. And you can see it's put into a canister and it's kind of like, um, like buckshot if you're familiar with that. There's small little balls on the inside. And same thing, those would be shot out and intended to take down uh, things like sails and rope so that ships couldn't get away very fast. And what else we got here? Just got two. Good thing they're not real artifacts. <laughs> Here's another cool one. This is actually the hilt of a sword. 
right? And this was found on a Spanish shipwreck here in Florida. Uh, the shipwreck dates to 1733. And so you can kind of see, here's the handle for the sword. Most of the blade on the sword was gone, rusted away. It's too thin metal. So what you're seeing is how it would have looked as archaeologists saw it in the sand, right? So it was scanned as it laid in the sand in South Florida. So pretty cool stuff. Let's see, I think we've got a question here. Dylan, did you have a question? Uh-oh, maybe he's frozen. Molly, did you have another question? Um, was the was the model ship um like flat or was it have like was it like looking like an actual ship, like a shape and everything? Oh, that's a good question. The little model, the ship thing that we saw, it was flat. It was just a thin piece of wood that was carved out in the shape of the side of a ship. That's a good question. Yeah, Molly. Did you need a raft for that? Did for you need a raft? Yeah. For um, the things that you 3D printed? No, we did not actually. Good question though. In mine, half the time we need to use a raft because, and we put painter's tape down all over it because it, if we didn't, we would have, it would, half of the, at least half the things that we've made would have been stuck to it. Yeah. And taken hours to get off. We're, we're very fortunate. The university has some really amazing 3D printers and some really fantastic people who are willing to help us with things like this. And they're professionals. So we're very fortunate that we have those kinds of resources. Yeah, good question though. All right, I've got one more artifact here. This one, and I don't know if anybody can tell what this is. This is actually um, a spyglass. Hi. Yeah, so I think Molly knew what it was there. So you would use something like this, and obviously this doesn't function, it's just a 3D model. It's got nothing in the sides, but this would have essentially been a telescope, right, for someone on the side of a ship so they could see really long distances while they're at sea. So. Pretty cool, and all of these artifacts, again, they're available online um, at the State of Florida's website. Let me see if I can put that in our, um, our box here real quick. Um, so that you all can check it out. It's really worth, worth seeing. All right, so the website is called Florida History in 3D. And let me see if that worked here. Nope. Let me go back, let me copy it, bring it back here. Sorry, I'm working on three monitors to do this. It can be kind of hard. So there we go, there's the link, Florida History in 3D. Spanish shipwrecks, lots of cool information on the shipwrecks and some really neat 3D models of the artifacts. Um, so definitely go check those out. Those are located in the gallery section. And you can see some of the ones I held up on there too. Pretty cool. Molly, you have another question? Did you use Tinkercad to um, print those? To you print the things? I'm not totally sure what they used. We actually, we worked with, like I said, some professionals here at the University of West Florida. We brought them the models that we wanted to get 3D printed and they did all the hard work for us. We just took them back and then painted mm -hmm. them to make them look like the artifacts. My, um, my science teacher, he got me a, he, we set up a um, Tinkercad account and then eventually I, when, when we got and built our own 3D printer, it's, now we can, I can just send them to my parents and then they'll print them out for me. And then I could, they found me one of, of Bast, the Egyptian goddess of cats. That's so cool. So good, I'm glad I brought these out. I was debating whether or not I had time to do it, but I'm glad I did. That's so cool. I wish I knew more about how to do it. I unfortunately do not. But we have a lot of help here at UWF, which is good. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that's all for the questions that I can see. It's actually good. I have another talk coming up in about 30 minutes um, on the shipwrecks of Northwest Florida, which anyone is welcome to join that one too. The information about that is on our website, fpan.us, um, which I'll send to everybody in case you want to join or can join. And if not, that's okay. Just stay on the lookout for more talks like this in the future. And thank you all for joining us today. Sarah, I don't know if you want to say anything, but you're welcome to. What's your 
Thank you for joining us and um, follow both the Florida Public Archaeology Network and the Bay County Public Library Facebook pages for more events. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. If you have a question, stay on and I will answer it for you. Everyone else is welcome to go. Yeah. I have a question. What's yes, your... Stephanie. Hold on. What's your question? What's your question? Do you dive and uncover things too? Yeah, I do. I dive. I learned how to dive maybe about 12 years ago. And at first I thought it was just really fun. I wanted, I live in Florida, like most of us, and I wanted to go see some of the cool shipwrecks and coral reef sites. And then I realized I could do it as part of my job as an archaeologist. And really that's how I got started. I just had the interest in diving. I had an interest in archaeology and why not put those two things together? It was perfect. I live in Pensacola, Florida too. Do you really? Yeah. So there's lots of good places to dive here someday when you decide if you want to learn how to dive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for coming. I have a question. Bye. 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 Yeah, did you have a question? I see someone with their hand up. Um, I like, um, I like all the pictures. I, um, I like, um, seeing the pictures and seeing all of the shipwrecks. Awesome. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Did you like the video of the people working underwater? Probably. Okay, good. That was a new thing I included. So I'm glad that everyone liked the photos that I put in the presentation. A lot of them I updated from my last presentation. So better photos this time around. All right, so we're right at three o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye because I have to get ready for my next presentation. I'll see everybody later. I hope we can do this again. Bye, Sarah. <laughs>